Hi, I'm Mackenzie Fagan, and this is 112BK. Coming up, signal problems. If you're an MTA commuter, you've heard the expression. Now hear from the author of the newsletter that chronicles MTA woes. You hear $215 million and you think, well, if only the MTA could get people to pay their fares, that's $215 million more money and we don't need these fare hikes. But that's not how it is at all. And then a new study says the cost of transportation here in the city is hundreds more a year for women than it is for men. It's an example of the pink tax. Two researchers behind the report will explain. Some of our key findings were that 75% of women responses indicated that they had been victims of harassment or theft on the city's public transportation, and this is compared to 47% of men. The report just came out explaining one of the reasons for an MTA fare increase in 2019. Fare beating, or turnstile jumping, accounted for a $215 million loss in 2018, to date, according to MTA President Andy Byford. That's a staggering number. To get some perspective on this and more, we're joined on the phone by freelance journalist and author of the newsletter Signal Problems, Aaron Gordon. Thanks for joining us, Aaron. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about uh, the fare evasion issue and why that is going to result in rate hikes. Well, so I, I'm not sure how much the issue itself will result in rate hikes. It's honestly been kind of hard to know what to make of the fare evasion issue. So for a couple of years now, but especially this year, the MTA has been saying that fare evasion is a primary uh, uh, cause of lower ridership and therefore lower revenue. Um, they're basically saying that because people aren't paying the fare, their ridership numbers appear lower than they actually are, and obviously their revenue is lower as a result of it. But they haven't presented much evidence of this until today. Um, today is actually the first time that we've gotten any sort of presentation or evidence presented to the public about how exactly how bad fare evasion is and um, what and and why it's affecting their bottom line so much. And there was an MTA uh, and, finance committee meeting today. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, it was this morning. And they presented some evidence. They did. Um, so it was it was a, the first report we've ever gotten on it. And as you said, um, they said that estimated revenue loss to Fair Vision in 2018 is 215 million dollars, and that's between both the subway and bus system. Fair evasion is much more severe on buses, but that's not new. Um, buses in other cities tend to have fare evasion of about 6 to 8%, give or take. Usually, but pretty much around 10% is industry accepted in most big cities. Um, but here in New York, they say that uh, fare evasion was as high as 19% during the recent quarter in 2018 and averages about 16%. So much higher here in New York than elsewhere. And for the subways, it's lower, but they say that they estimate fare evasion about 3.8%. Now, this amount, taken in total, that means they're basically the MTA is basically saying that about 550,000 riders a day um, do not pay the fare for the subway and buses, which is a really staggering number. And how are they arriving at these figures? Do they have uh, somebody go undercover and just watch for turnstile jumpers or people who don't swipe when they enter a bus? I mean, it's a good question. Um, so their their report today, which basically amounted to a PowerPoint presentation, um, did have a slide on methodology, um, but it's a little vague and amounts to basically bullet points. And what they say is that um, they have, I'll read it from you right here, staff visit several assigned subway stations, bus routes each day to observe and record evasion of different types. So they basically have people watching is more or less what they say, but they, they aren't very specific about exactly how many people are watching, at how many different stations. Um, they say 180 station control areas, but that could, you know, there's a, you know, a set of turnstiles at, you know, there are many sets of turnstiles at a bunch of stations, so it's not clear how many actual separate stations that is. And so, you know, they gave us, like, some idea of how they measured it, but not a lot of detail. And do we anticipate that the release of this report is going to lead to a crackdown on fare evaders? Yeah, I would say one of the main kind of issues taking away from this report, and it's really hard to like know what to make of this report, right? And and um, one of the main things that's hard to kind of suss out is what exactly the result is going to be. Um, there seems to be a little bit of a difference of it. The, the report was given to this you know finance committee meeting, 
and uh, there seemed to be a difference of reaction amongst board members about how they should receive this information, like what they should do about it. Um, I'm not sure it's probably it's probably too simplistic to say there will be a crackdown. Um, I think the MTA will take measures to try and enforce fair payment more. Um, but what exactly those efforts will look like, I think, is very much an open question. And Aaron, talk to us a little bit about the mayor's response. Uh, there's a tweet that you wrote that says, Mayor de Blasio is always giving bad answers to precisely the wrong questions. What did you mean by that? Oh, that, that has to do with a separate issue. That was, um, that was about e-bikes, um, where, it, I mean, it's, it's somewhat related in terms of uh, approach to enforcement of transit policy in the city, but that was about... Um, how the mayor basically was talking about how the city is enforcing their ban on e-bikes um, or the law about e-bikes, I shouldn't say it's a ban, um, and basically said that he doesn't understand why anyone would want to ride an e-bike when the whole point of bicycling is to get exercise, and he thinks that e-bikes don't provide any exercise. Um, of course, that's simply ridiculous um, because a lot of people don't ride bikes specifically for exercise, a lot of them ride it for transportation. Right, it's not a spin class. Right, and specifically with e-bikes, they're very popular amongst delivery workers where, you know, I think Gotham has did an article where they put fitness trackers on delivery workers to find out how far they go during a shift, and during a 12-hour shift they can ride upwards of 80 miles. So it's a little absurd to say that, you know, they should get the exercise by riding on a regular bike to do 80 miles every day. Um, I'm not, I, I think even the mayor wouldn't be able to handle that. And Aaron, just last question before we go. Were you surprised by the $215 million number? Yeah, I was. Um, I was surprised by a lot of things in this report. And um, I think kind of what myself and my, my colleagues in, uh, who report on transit in the city will have to do going forward is to dig deeper into these numbers, into the assumptions that underlay these figures, because they are very shocking. But at the same time, there's reason to suspect that they may not be saying exactly what it sounds like it's saying. Um, so, like, you hear $215 million, and you think, well, the, if only the MTA could get people to pay their fares, that's $215 million more money, and we don't need these fare hikes. But that's not how it is at all. Um, for one, every transit system in the world has to accept some degree of variation because to do otherwise would to result in draconian enforcement measures that I don't think anybody wants. The second uh, issue is the presentation seems to assume, and I'm, I'm waiting for word on the MTA whether this is actually the case or not, but at least based on the way they discussed it today in the meeting, uh, it sure sounds like it assumes that every single person who went through, say, an emergency door at a subway station or went through the back door of a bus um, simply didn't pay their, didn't pay a fare. So they may be overcounting. Yeah, yeah, and that may be money the MTA lost, but that's not true because, like, they may some of those people may have unlimited metro cards, in which case swiping wouldn't mean any more money. Right. And they might be going through the, you know, the fastest entrance because they right. think it doesn't matter because right. they have an unlimited card. So there are a lot of like little issues like that, that or maybe not so little ones, that kind of um, need to be dug into further to see how much these numbers can be taken at face value. Absolutely. Aaron Gordon, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. The pink tax. It's basically gender-based price discrimination that sees a surcharge on products marketed specifically to women, like baby pink razors and bubblegum-colored tricycles for girls. A New York City Department of Consumer Affairs report from a few years ago found that products marketed to women cost an average of 7% more than products marketed toward men, which is especially cool considering that women still make 82 cents on the dollar compared to men. But now comes a new report that women also pay more for transportation in the city. How is that? Well, according to the study, this happens when, for example, women worry about harassment or safety on public transport, so they opt for cabs or ride-hailing apps instead. This pink tax amounts to hundreds of dollars per year for women, according to the study. To tell us more about it and what, if anything, is being done to counter it, we're joined by two of the report's authors, researchers with NYU's Rudin Center for Transportation, Gloria Campbell, Welcome to Moment 2BK. Thanks for having us. And Christopher Pollack, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. So tell me a little bit about how this line of research came about. Gloria? Yeah, so in the fall of this year, the Rudin Center uh, distributed a mobility survey to 550 New Yorkers. 
and we were looking to study New Yorkers' mobility habits. Um, through this, we got a lot of information about the disparities between men and women and how uh, women and men tend to use city transportation uh, just a little bit differently. Um, some of our key findings were that 75% of women responses indicated that they had been victims of harassment or theft on the city's public transportation, and this is compared to 47% of men. Um, there's also another result we found was that 88% of total respondents indicated that they uh, did not report their uh, incident of harassment or theft to the authorities or to um, public transportation officials. Um, and uh, we also found that many women uh, at night, especially, about 30% do not ride public transportation. They are opting uh, generally to more expensive modes like uh, for higher vehicles, and that's your taxis and Ubers and Lyfts. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, you found that the experiences of men and women um, on public transportation was different, and then as a result, how they uh, incorporated public transportation and other methods of transit into their daily lives. Is that right? Exactly. We found that there is a difference in how men and women respond to different perceived threats, maybe, on public transportation. So, like Gloria said, 30% um, of women, in response to that perceived safety threat, opt for alternative modes of transportation at night, um, and it's only like 8% for men. Um, in addition, we found that many respondents that were female said that they dress differently um, when they use public transportation, um, up to like 12%, and that was only 3% for men. So there are differences in how people respond to these different threats, um, and so we know that they do exist for both genders, obviously, but there's a need to address more of the issues that females are facing in the city. And these 550 people who were surveyed, were they in one part of the city, uh, men and women, different socioeconomic backgrounds, races? How did you find these respondents? Yeah, so I think that's really key in understanding our study. Uh, our, set, our survey was distributed through the Rudin Center's network. Um, and so we ended up getting a lot of results that were um, from residents of Manhattan and residents of Brooklyn, um, a significant portion of our respondents had college degrees, um, and about three quarters were white. So um, I think that's like really key to understand when we're interpreting these results, but I also think that um, women as um, a whole and all female New Yorkers are facing, um, facing challenges and issues, and um, that these results can be um, extrapolated and applied to um, the whole city. And Chris, are there plans to expand the survey? Yes, definitely. So um, like Gloria was saying, we recognize that not everyone may have the financial means to opt for different modes of transportation. So we are definitely um, already planning to conduct another survey to kind of capture a larger range of experiences in New York City. Um, and that way we can kind of better understand what are uh, different people's motivations for opting for these different modes and how are they responding to it, especially in other areas of the city that didn't have access maybe to um, our online survey, that didn't receive a copy of it. Um, so we're, we're going to be a lot more deliberate, uh, deliberate about how we get the survey out to new people. Right, it seems like socioeconomic background and also um, you know, living in Manhattan versus an outer borough certainly would have an impact on the exactly. modes of transportation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, talk to me a little bit as well about um, the fact that women often do the bulk of caregiving um, for children, for, for elderly members of their family, and how that might impact their use of transit. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that 75% of caretakers in the United States as a whole are women, um, and while we don't have comparable data for New York City specifically, um, we know that um, in general that those who do take caretaker trips in New York City spend a significant um, additional amount on transportation on top of any other reasons they may have for switching. Um, so our report found that um, if you are a caretaker as well, you could spend an additional $26 to $50 per month alone just for those caretaker trips. So that could be for you know transporting your children to school or taking care of an elderly family member. So that has an additional impact on um, cost. And we know that um, that could disproportionately affect uh, women in the city. And Gloria, were you surprised by these findings? Yeah, um, personally, I was not surprised. As a woman who takes New York City public transportation every single day, um, I take into account my safety and my perceived uh, 
safety when I make these decisions. And I think that's the case for a lot of um, women New Yorkers. Uh, and I think having this kind of notion uh, quantified in our data results or in our survey results uh, will be really helpful when we um, start talking about solutions to this issue. So what are some of your recommendations for the MTA, for the Department of Transportation? I could see someone saying, well, it's not the MTA's responsibility to dismantle the patriarchy and make sure that women feel safe on par with men. But what are some concrete steps that you think could be taken? Yeah, so uh, we also held a panel discussion uh, this fall, and we had uh, leaders from the MTA and from the World Bank, um, women who were starting startups to address these very issues. Um, and they, through this discussion, came up, came up with like really great um, solutions, some recommendations. And the first is a technological solution. So um, monitoring uh, New York City public transportation um, can be really effective in catching perpetrators. So whether that is cameras on the subway um, and also educating our first responders um, so that they're sensitive and they're effective when they respond to victims of harassment and theft. Um, lastly, getting women into leadership positions within the transportation industry uh, is key. Having women and people with diverse backgrounds on the inside and working on solutions um, could be really effective uh, when we are thinking about change. An important thing that well, we want to consider too in our next uh, iteration of our survey is that a lot of the incidents of harassment that occur actually happen during rush hour. So we found that a majority of them happen during rush hour. So while it is important to focus on the late night um, aspects of you know empty stations and those, those safety issues, there, there needs to be something that addresses how people are affected when trains are packed and people um, commit acts there and th that's a little bit harder to deal with in some mm -hmm. instances. So we want to look into that more as well, too. So you guys are urban planners, and this to me seems like an example of um, design that is taking difference into consideration, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know Vienna conducted a survey in the 90s and found similar results that women use transportation differently than men and started incorporating that into their urban planning. Uh, Japan, I know, has subway cars that are just for women um, to prevent the type of harassment that we've talked about. So what do you think the benefit of a sort of holistic view of, of design or urban planning is? Like how can this help not just women, but people with other differences as well? Yeah, I um, think design is critical and it is one of the important parts when we're talking about a holistic um, solutions. I think uh, most New Yorkers are aware that uh, subway stations are not accessible uh, to a lot of New Yorkers and a lot of them are not ADA compliant. So I think that's a uh, really good starting point and something to um, press the MTA to install elevators to make sure their elevators are working. And it's actually one of the priorities in um, MTA's fast forward plan. Um, so it's on, it's on their mind and hopefully that will be changing um, moving forward. And that will be really helpful, especially when we're talking about caretakers getting strollers into the subway, um, and, as well as helping those with disabilities. ADA, of course, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Correct, yes. absolutely. I think it is really important to also look to other countries to see like what they've kind of uh, proposed as solutions. And like you mentioned, there are a lot of countries that have those separate um, cars for women, and that's not something we really considered because there could be other like implications for that as far as like a cultural normalization. Right, that also seems problematic. Exactly, yeah. so that could be problematic in many ways. So. Um, it is important, like you said, to kind of bring more people into that design phase. So if we did, could include more women in leadership roles and mm -hmm. put people into positions where they can be a part of that redesign, um, then the service will reflect the people that it should. Mm -hmm. So this report has been getting a lot of press, and you mentioned that there have been some town hall meetings or convenings. Is that right? Correct. Are there some concrete next steps that are coming out of this in addition to expanding the scope of the survey? Yeah. I guess at, at the moment we don't have any upcoming like uh, public events of that sort, um, but once we work on this next iteration, then I think we'll have a better you know, roadmap for where to go next, because um, we really still need to investigate some other, some more specific detailed questions about um, why people are changing their transportation habits or maybe even an exact dollar amount, um, more specific dollar amount of what the impact of this is, especially for caretakers. Um, 
So I think once we have some of those answers, then we'll be able to kind of map out where to go next and who to kind of bring it, oops, um, who to bring into that. What interested you um, in participating in this, in this research specifically? Why were you guys drawn to both urban planning, but more specifically thinking about transportation and the impact of gender on how people get around the city? I mean, personally, I guess I can't speak to um, like a safety threat on public transportation, um, but I've always been kind of in, interested in how we can bring more perspectives into urban planning issues in general, um, because they have been dominated by specific groups over the, I mean, since the beginning of time almost. So um, I'm constantly thinking about ways to kind of make it a more collaborative process so that we can design cities and spaces to be for all sorts of people, not just like certain people. And I think um, starting this conversation in New York City uh, is really critical and is something that uh, hasn't been discussed enough and is long overdue, um, that women uh, have specific challenges um, that are not uh, being appropriately addressed in the city. Um, so I think it's time to create change and I'm glad that Chris and I could be here. Uh, to raise awareness. I'm very glad as well. Um, so this is an example of something that people call the pink tax, as mm -hmm. we mentioned, where you have examples of the exact same product uh, being sold or marketed to men and being marketed to women, but the female product is more expensive, even though it's the exact same item. Um, but people sometimes believe that the pink tax doesn't actually exist, that this is sort of like an overhyped uh, figment of the media's imagination. What do you say to those people? Well, I guess the common argument is that, um, you know, you have the same metro card price for anyone regardless of their gender. Um, but in our survey, we found that there is an actual dollar amount um, that ends up being a monthly transportation cost just for those reasons. And those are reasons that could essentially be attributed solely to gender. So um, while it, it's true that the, the service itself um, costs the same for both groups, there is a disproportionate impact on monthly travel expenses as a result of different cultural and also like actual tangible effects. And so um, that's important to consider, that it's not just a strict view of like, oh, this, this product doesn't cost the same. It's really more about what are the effects of this sort of like system and, and how do we address that. Right, it's sort of the user experience, exactly. even though everybody pays the same amount for a monthly yes. Metro card. Right. Exactly. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on the show. Chris, thank Gloria, you. really appreciate your time. Us. Thank you. You may not have heard that Lyft, the rideshare company, has purchased Motivate, the parent company for City Bike. This announcement comes on the heels of the City Council introducing a set of bills that aim to legalize dockless electric stand-up scooters and throttle electric bikes. Yes, despite appearances, those battery-powered delivery vehicles whizzing along bike lanes and sometimes on sidewalks are not currently legal. Mayor Bill de Blasio would like to keep it that way. He thinks e-bikes are a safety hazard. So where is our micro-mobility journey headed? That's today's issue on the table. Based on hype alone, the rise of dockless electric scooters seems to be the most meaningful shift towards a less car-centric future. But scooters have gotten a mixed reception in other cities. They have a problematic safety record, and older New Yorkers would apparently rather sit than stand. All this makes advocates for electric bikes think they're the prime movers in the evolution of urban transit. It's been just about four months since the first pedal assist bicycles rolled out in New York as part of the DOT's dockless bike share pilot. These boosted bikes, which propel riders at speeds of up to 20 miles per hour if you're also pedaling, are already massively popular with city riders. If you're thinking, I've seen these speedy guys before, followed by a waft of Thai food, you wouldn't be wrong. But you're thinking about throttle assist bikes, which propel the rider with no pedaling motion, go even faster, and are the preferred method of transit for delivery guys in the ever-competitive home delivery realm. Getting food to the customer sooner, of course, means more deliveries and more tips. These riders feel de Blasio's opposition to e-bikes is targeting them specifically. The mayor says they represent a real danger, and his administration has been cracking down. Now the city council is hoping to change all this. Along with pedal-assist bikes, which have technically always been legal, a majority of the council seems ready to legalize all electric bicycles, much to de Blasio's displeasure. City Bike plans to roll out even more e-bikes as part of the contingency efforts around the L-Train shutdown. An additional 800 pedal-assist bikes will be on the streets, clustered at stations in Williamsburg and Lower Manhattan. 
When we say yes to new ideas for transit, especially green, accessible, and innovative ones, we aren't just saying yes to a particular model of e-bike or scooter. We are saying yes to a bigger idea, empowering more people to get out of a car. Now, how could a climate mayor say no to that? Especially on a day when the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, A, C, E, B, D, F, M, Jay-Z, N, Q, R, W, and G trains are running with delays. Of course, the MTA apologizes for the inconvenience. And now some parting thoughts. I was a Reagan baby, but George H.W. Bush, or George Bush, as he was known in those simpler times, is the first president I remember. In kindergarten, along with my address and phone number, we were quizzed on the president of the United States. My parents helped me with my memorization, and I remember being aware that the Fagans were not fans. In fact, a piece of family lore is that sometime during H.W. Bush's vice presidency, he came to Oregon to fly fish. My father, who had also been fishing that day, was thrilled to read in the paper that Bush was downstream of him, meaning he had effectively pissed on one of his least favorite politicians. From today's vantage point, it is shocking to see how moderate Bush seems. Granted, this is a man who stood by Clarence Thomas and did nothing as AIDS ravaged a generation. The race-baiting Willie Horton ad made for his campaign was also a political low that set the standard for our current generation of political lows. But compared to what passes for mainstream rhetoric among today's Republicans, the senior Bush's politics seemed downright centrist. He broke with Reagan's voodoo economics and raised taxes, breaking a campaign promise and costing him his bid for re-election. And he signed the Clean Air Act. I'm nostalgic for a gentler time when our political foes were merely the conservative, entitled sons of dynasties rather than the hate-mongering, unhinged, entitled sons of dynasties. With H.W. Bush and his ilk, at least you had a sense that there were some lines of respect and decency that he wouldn't cross. Do I sound like a wistful octogenarian? Maybe so, but you'll find me here with my Columbo reruns, a tartan blanket, and Werther's Originals thinking of simpler times. That's the show for today. Tomorrow, Jarrett Murphy will be in to talk about electoral reform, voting, campaign finance, the whole biz. Hope you can check it out.